Here is the fourth pattern from the gang of four. This one is called prototype pattern. And it's a pattern you use when creating new objects. Here's a quick summary of what we're trying to accomplish with this pattern. The prototype pattern is a good choice when you are trying to accomplish the following. You have a prototype object instance and you want to create new objects by copying the prototype. Constructing a new object from zero takes a lot of time and effort. You want to move all construction logic away from the calling code. OK, let's go through the points one by one. The key intent is that you need to construct an object with construction logic that always requires a number of identical steps. For example, you might be constructing a document that needs to be loaded from an XML file. And no matter what document you create, you always start out with the same generic XML code. Initializing a document in this scenario is a complex process. Simply instantiating a class is not enough. You also need to load and parse the generic file, load and parse any extra customizations, and initialize the document. The prototype pattern helps you to standardize the generic part of each document. The idea is that you load the generic XML once and store it in a prototype instance. Each time when you want to construct a new document, you simply clone the prototype instance in memory and then customize the clone. The prototype pattern offers a number of benefits over straight-up construction of objects using the new keyword. First, the prototype pattern is ideal if the construction process occurs in a number of discrete steps. Initializing the prototype once and copying it in memory each time you need a new object is much more convenient than manually constructing and initializing each object. This will simplify your code. Second, there's a big performance benefit too. Initializing your objects from an external file, say an XML file, can be very slow. It's much faster to do this only once for the prototype object and then copy the prototype in memory each time you need a new object. Here is the UML diagram of the prototype pattern. The pattern is really simple with only a few classes. The prototype class is an abstract base class that provides a clone method. There are two subclasses named concrete prototype 1 and concrete prototype 2 that both implement the clone method. When the client needs a new object, it declares a variable of type prototype and instantiates it with either concrete prototype 1 or concrete prototype 2. It then calls the clone method to acquire a copy of the concrete prototype. Let me show you an example of the prototype pattern. You might have noticed that the images of my Udemy courses all look the same. It's always a laptop with some kind of funny picture on the screen. The image for this course shows the blueprint of the Wright Flyer 1, the very first powered aeroplane 
launched by the Wright brothers in 1903. My other Udemy courses have different images. I have a course on multi-threading that shows spools of thread. And I have a course on memory management that shows two cards of the memory card game. So I'm going to write a program to create these images. The process of constructing these images is always the same. I start with a bitmap. Then I load the laptop image into it. And then I add whatever course image is appropriate. The course image is blended over the laptop image so that it fits exactly into the laptop screen. I could construct each image by hand, but instead I'm going to use the prototype pattern. I will implement the pattern with the following classes. Let's take a look at the code. I'll start with the clonable class. This is simply an abstract class that sets up the clone method. Nothing special here. I could have used an interface too, but I'll stick with an abstract class to match the design pattern. Next is course image. This is the actual prototype and represents the laptop image. Here is an initialize method that sets up the object. You can see that I load the laptop image from disk. From here on, the prototype is ready for use. And down here is the implemented clone method. You can see that I start by calling the memberwise clone method. This creates a shallow copy of the prototype image and stores it in the clone variable. But now I have a problem. The copy refers to the same image as the prototype. So, if I try to make any modifications to the copy, I would be also modifying the prototype image. To fix this, I call the clone method on the bitmap. This will create a duplicate of the bitmap and assign it to the copy. So now, both the prototype and the copy refer to unique and separate images. Next is the Course Image Maker class. This is the client class that will construct the course images for me. The class has a createImage method that expects the prototype and a file path as arguments. It will then clone the prototype, load a second image, and blend that second image on top of the prototype image. And finally, let's take a look at the main program method. The code here instantiates the prototype and initializes it. Then it uses the course image maker to create three course images and write them to disk. Let me run the program to prove that everything is working. I am compiling the code now. And now I am running the program. OK, so now the program has run without errors. I am going to open a file browser window now, so I can show you the assembled course images. Here we go. And there they are. Three course images. Everything works fine.
Okay, here is a quick checklist you can use to implement the prototype pattern. First, make sure your objects have complex multi-step initialization code and that they're all derived from the same generic template. Then, create an abstract prototype that declares a clone method. Create concrete prototypes that implement the clone method. Then, add a client class that initializes objects by starting with a cloned prototype. And finally, make sure the calling code does not use new anywhere and only uses the client to create new instances. And here are some final comments. My example used a base class and I mentioned that you can also use an interface. Now you might be aware that the .NET framework already has an interface for cloning objects. It's called iClonable. So why didn't I use that one? The reason I didn't use iClonable is because it is completely unclear if iClonable should create a shallow or a deep copy. Microsoft never defined how the interface should behave. And therefore, they actually discourage you from using it in any kind of public interface. Instead, you are encouraged to create your own clone method, just like I did in my code. Here's the difference between a shallow copy and a deep copy. In a shallow copy, all value types and references are copied. The clone contains copies of each value type member, but all of the reference type members will be shared between the clone and the prototype. A deep copy goes one step further. The value types and references are copied, but also all of the objects that the reference types refer to. This creates a deep copy of the original prototype that does not share any objects with it. It's super easy to create a shallow copy in .NET. All you need to do is call the memberwise clone method. But there's no standard way to create a deep copy. You have to manually clone each reference type member, just like I did in my bitmap field. But here's a tip. There's a very quick and easy way to instantly create a deep copy of any object. All you need to do is serialize the prototype into a memory stream and then deserialize it back into a clone. This code will do exactly that. OK, here is a summary of what we have learned. The prototype pattern provides an interface for constructing objects by copying a prototype and modifying the copy. Use this pattern if your object's initialization is expensive and all objects share a common generic template. The clone method can either make a shallow or a deep copy of the prototype. A quick and easy way to make a deep copy is by serializing the prototype into a memory stream and deserializing it back into a clone. You should never use the iClonable interface in public code because Microsoft never defined 
if it should make a shallow or a deep copy 